Hello everyone, I've got another behind the mix video for you today. This time I'll be briefly going over some of the elements of the Shadow of Intent mix and what made that set one of my favorite mixes to date. Just a reminder that prior to every new video, I do the entire mixing process live on my Twitch channel, shown at the link below. Be sure to give that channel a follow if you want to know what videos are coming next and how it all comes together. You can also subscribe for free using Twitch Prime if you have Amazon Prime, it'll help support this channel as well. Thanks again for all your support and I hope you enjoyed this video. Alright, let's start by just listening to the raw drum tracks. No mixing, no processing. This is a kick trigger, a snare top, a snare bottom, three tom mics, a hi-hat mic, and left and right overheads. So the drum sounded really good just straight off the board. And um, a lot of that had to do with how it was played. It's very clean playing, but also the drums are very, they're tuned very well and the overheads are very clean. So I had a lot to work with here, which kind of leads to a better end result. When it comes to a kick trigger, things are pretty easy because obviously you don't have any bleed from the rest of the kit and the kick already sounds like a kick for metal so that obviously makes my job a lot easier and it requires a lot less processing but i still did a bit of work to the kick just to make sure it blended in the mix the way i wanted it to i'm just gonna go ahead and show you my settings instead of going into each band of the eq and the way it was set you can just kind of take a look at what it's doing and i'll just compare with this on and off So obviously I'm making the kick sound sharper. I'm compressing it just a little bit to make it sound a little tighter. And um, overall, just giving the kick more presence and a little bit of a gate because even with triggers, you get a little bit of like an echo to it. And I just like to tighten it up as much as I can. I do have another compressor on the kick, uh, the LA-2A from Waves. Uh, it's not a ton of peak reduction, but it is helping the presence of the kick a little bit more in my mix. So I am getting a little bit of extra output gain uh, through the knob on the left here, and that is going to make it louder, but the little bit of compression actually did help the kick sit a little bit better in my mix. And on top of that, I just have one more EQ, which most likely came after I mixed the guitars, just to get the kick exactly where I wanted it in the mix. Usually by the time all my guitars are mixed, I have to kind of like find the perfect frequency for where my kick needs to sit. So uh, if, depending on how bright the guitar tones are, where I boost will change a little bit. But in this case, I went with 4.1K. And uh, obviously that's what I decided to go with in the end. And it just worked for this mix in particular. All right, so as far as the EQ for the snare top and the snare bottom, I'll play with and without. And keep in mind that the snare bottom does have the invo invert polarity switch pushed. So uh, the mics were out of phase with each other and hitting this corrected that and made the snare sound a lot better. So here's with and without EQ. And then both channels do have a little bit of compression on them. CLA-76 on the top, and a DBX-160 on the bottom. I tend not to go too harsh with my attack on my snares, because I do still want them to pop in my mix. If I had turned this all the way to 7, it'd pretty much be crushing my snare top to the point where it would sound like it's in another room. So here are my snare tracks with and without compression. So it does sound quieter when I do that, but 
that does mean also that the blast beats and those small notes in between the bigger hits are coming up in volume and there's not as drastic of a difference between the top and the bottom anymore. So when he blasts versus um, a heavy breakdown where he's hitting the snare as hard as possible, there's no longer as drastic of a volume difference. So it may sound drastic right now with and without. Obviously it sounded really good without, but when it came to the end of the mix, this compression worked. So I am going to skip over the toms because I have talked about mixing toms in a few behind the mix videos in the past and I pretty much mix toms the way I mix toms. I'd find the frequencies I don't like in them and I take them out and if I need more attack I boost the attack. So I'm not really going to talk about toms in this video but what I am going to talk about is the overheads because I don't always have overheads in my recordings and they were very important because of the accent symbols. So here's how the overheads just sounded straight up. So obviously this mix would have sounded, it still would have sounded good, but the drum mix itself would have been way different had I not had these overheads. Because now you're hearing the ride bell, you're hearing the splashes and the stacks, whatever accent symbols he's using in this case. As far as the EQ goes, I did the same thing on both sides, taking out a lot of the low end, boosting a little bit of the top end, but I am taking out the very, very top just because it was clashing pretty heavily with the guitars. And then a compressor that's pretty much destroying them and making sure that every single thing that hits those overheads is getting squashed to death. And that just that's how I like to mix my overheads. So here's the overheads without anything, then with EQ, and then with the compression. Keep in mind it is going to get a bit quieter once the compression comes in. So yeah, I personally really like putting a lot of compression on overheads that applies to live and in studio. I can't get as drastic with it in live because you can hear the vocals. In this video, you don't really hear the guitars and bass as much because they were running direct for everything, but you hear a little bit of the PA coming back and you hear the vocals, obviously. And on top of that, that's what's going on, on each side. I do have an overhead bus with further EQ even more compression and even more compression after that. I do have a side chain compressor here and it's only compressing the very, very top end of the cymbals. And it's really just to make sure that those splashes and ride bells aren't cutting through too much compared to the crashes and the hats. It's just like an overall balancing thing for the very top end of the cymbals. And they were coming through pretty hot in my mix and this kind of helped tame it. So this is what you're compressing when you have it set like this. So this compressor is really only crushing those high frequencies. So my drums are still coming through as much as I want them to because the mid range of my overheads is not being compressed at all, but the cymbals, the brilliance of them is getting compressed quite a bit. So let's take a look at the whole drum mix with everything turned on with and without the overheads. So without overheads. And with. So in most of my videos, the symbols pretty much come from the bleed into the tom mics. But in this case, I had full control over how much symbols were coming through. Obviously, there was still a little bit of bleed in the toms, but I didn't have to bring the symbols out in those mics. So in the future, I'm actually going to have overhead mics from now on. Um, a company called MXL is sending me a pair of overhead mics for me to use with my recordings. So shout out to MXL. Thank you. You're being very generous by doing so. 
So in the future, all my recordings will have overhead mics from now on. And I think that's pretty important considering how much it helped me in this mix. And uh, all my future mixes will give me a lot more to work with when it comes to getting my drum tones. So here's where things get kind of weird. It's a single guitar track coming direct out. Um, without anything on it, it sounds great. But I did have to do a lot to make it fit in the way that I felt fit the mix the best. So obviously it's a great tone, but I did do a lot of things to it to make it fit between the bass, the tracks, the drums, the vocals, just a little bit here and there. Um, it, it made a huge difference. So the EQ, nothing crazy, taking out the sub stuff that I don't want, taking out a little bit of that digital fuzz, which you're going to get with any direct out. But overall, the boosts and the cuts are very minor. So it's a direct out tone. It sounds very dry. So I decided to put a little bit of a very small light plate on it. It's really not an audible, an audible reverb, but it did help a little bit with just making it not sound so dry, direct, and in your face. And that is also the beginning of the widening effect that I'm trying to get. But after the reverb, there's just a little bit of compression just to, you know, get it exactly where I want it to sit in my mix. Nothing really crazy as far as like audible differences in volume with or without the compressor. That's exactly how I like it. Uh, pretty fast on the attack and the release. And then I'm just kind of messing with the input knob until I get the amount of gain reduction I want and using the output knob to make up that amount of gain reduction. So beyond all that is where things get kind of weird. I have this plugin called the PS22X Split from Waves. It's about a hundred dollar plugin, but you can get it from $40 usually. It goes on sale quite often. And how this thing works is, I mean, honestly, I can't fully explain it, but it widens your signal based on your crossover point of frequency, and you choose how much processing you want to be done to it to make it sound wider. And in this case, I want to keep my low frequencies, the stuff below 257, I guess, uh, in the mono field still. I don't mind that stuff being in the mono field, but what I don't want is this heavy amount of tracks and kick and snare and a mono guitar fighting with the vocals. Because uh, I really like how the vocals came out in this mix, and I think a lot of that has to do with how wide I made the guitar and the tracks on top of everything else. So this plugin's kind of crazy, and when used too much, it can definitely make things sound really phasey and weird, but uh, everyone watching my stream thought that this was like kind of the make or break for the guitar. So I felt like it was important to showcase what it's doing and how much it's making one guitar sound like a guitar in the left and a guitar on the right. So when you're A-B-ing it like that, it's pretty obvious that it's taking one guitar signal and like messing with it as much as it can to make it sound like two guitar signals pretty much. But when you're not listening to that specific part of it and not like comparing the dry mono to the processed stereo, it fits in the mix way better this way. <laughs> And then because I used a plugin that's using phasing and weird like frequency manipulation to create a stereo image, 
I do have to put one more EQ on there just to get it sounding how I want it to sound, which is as close to the original tone as possible. So I'm just taking out the hissing, but then this cut at 250 is kind of taking out that weird, like, mid-rangey weirdness that you get from using this stereo imaging plugin on the guitar. So I felt like this EQ cleaned up the tone and kind of made up for all the weird trickery that I did to it and just helped it fit in the mix a lot better. So you made it to this part of the video and obviously you made it to this part for a reason. You want to hear what the vocal sounded like going straight into the microphone. And honestly, it's impressive. I'm going to take everything off my vocal chain and uh, I'll even mute the effects. Yeah. Here's what the vocals sound like going straight into the microphone. Light as the evil on the watchful light. Light is silent or die. Oh, how divine. Your strength sword or the human sword. Uh. So, obviously, I get a lot of help when a vocalist is as talented as this. The amount of control that he has over his tone, his volume, his projection, and being able to do that for almost an hour is crazy to me. My vocal chain for these vocals are very typical of what I run. I'm doing a lot of presence boosting because, obviously, the lower range stuff it needs a little bit of help to get over the guitars because by this point I've done stereo tracks, I've done stereo guitar, I've done a heavy amount of bass processing, 10, 11 tracks of drums. So anything that I can do to get the presence added to the vocals, I'm going to do. Light as the evil on the watchful light. Life is silent or die. Oh, how divine. Your sick sword or the human sword. Mind the S's are kind of a little painful to hear before the de -esser, but I have another compressor on top of that. Light as the evil on the watchful light. Light is silent or die. Oh, how divine. Your sick sword or the human sword. So no apparent volume change. That's pretty much always my goal with compression is however much I'm compressing down, I'm going to bring it back up that same amount. Unless I need a little bit of boost, just I'll push it a little higher if I need a little bit more volume. I like to do most of my volume changes in the compressors, not so much on my faders. I pretty much always mix with all my faders at zero other than a couple exceptions such as the hi-hat being really loud, but all my faders are at zero because I use my compressor output gain to get it where I want in the mix. It's just easier for me if I'm mixing 10 songs by the same band. I know that all my faders need to be at zero and that all the plug-in stuff is what puts the mix where it's supposed to be. So I don't have to write down like, oh, guitar is at minus nine on this song and uh, needs to go up to minus six when it's a solo or like, it's just way easier for me when it's all zero. But the de-esser is very important here. Uh, you can listen actually to what is being taken and you know, it's not being taken out, it's being forced down a lot so it's not so harsh on your ears. So those S's are very hard and you can see how much the meter is being hit here. I'm going to go back to just playing it with and without. And you can just watch everything be on the white line here, how much it's taking it and making it not so harsh on the ears. Life is silent or die. Oh, how divine. Your sick sword or the human sword. Uh. Now, another trick that I've been wanting to talk about and I just never really found a good opportunity because I rarely want to talk about the vocal tracks in these videos, but this is an exception. I use de on all my vocal channels, no matter what, 
because it helps keep the symbol bleed at bay. Obviously, when you're dealing with a small stage like the Foundry, the vocal is not that far away from the drum. Uh, so, you know, he's probably standing three feet at most in front of the drum set most of the set. And the amount of cymbals that's coming through that mic is kind of crazy when there's no vocals going on. I'll try to find a better example that uses crash cymbals. There we go. So this is with and without my de-esser, keeping in mind that it's not just taking out the S's and the T's and all the harsh consonants that de-essers typically use. It's also keeping my cymbals down in my vocal mics. So in this case, it's not as crazy, but with some bands, especially uh, bands who keep their vocals on stands, which are usually pointed directly at the drums when the person doing vocals is not in front of the mic, these vocal channels will add up real quick with cymbal bleed, especially if there's three or four vocalists in the band. So this de thing is kind of like my go-to to keep that stuff under control because a lot of my videos without this de trick there would just be way too much cymbal bleed and it would be painful. And considering how much I boost the top end in my vocals, there's going to be a lot of cymbals no matter what. So the de is kind of counteracting the boosting that I'm doing up here. So because I do this, I have to do this. But also just because it's a small stage and the vocal mics are usually pointed straight at the drums. So not much I can do about that. So... Hopefully you enjoyed this pretty in-depth video of the Shadow of Intent mix, uh, and you finally get to hear some vocals. So uh, if you enjoyed this, please hit like, please hit subscribe, and please follow my Twitch channel if uh, you want to see more stuff like this, or if you just want to be a good person and help your boy out. Uh, so yeah. Keep an eye out for a new upload in the next day or two. I have a ton more bands recorded and even more cool shows coming up. So as always, I appreciate all your guys' support and I'll see you in the next video.